All right, well, we're going to get started tonight. Uh, welcome to, uh, what is session is this? Session 12 of our Revelation series as we continue our look into this final book uh, in our Bible uh, that we began, honestly, we began at Crossroads all the way back to the beginning of this year. Um, and so you can tell it's a long book when we're in July and we're still plugging our way through. And uh, But it's hopefully been a insightful look at what God um, reveals to us through his, his disciple John, uh, who wrote these words down, who had these visions, and uh, was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write them down for the benefit of the church, but also of the benefit of possibly people that are around after the church. So um, we certainly uh, can be edified. We know all scripture is given and is profitable uh, for us to read through and to understand and to hopefully get a better glimpse of who God is and who we are in him. So um, that's certainly what I've taken away from a lot of this time in Revelation is just being even more in awe of our great God and uh, being more thankful that I'm chosen, that I'm uh, on his team, that I'm part of the victory, that he's won for us on that cross. And so with that, I'm going to begin with a word of prayer and then we'll dive into our session this week. Pray. Heavenly Father, God, we're just so grateful to be gathered again in your name and in this place to open up your word, God, to understand your revelation and to um, have a deeper understanding of, of the events as you describe them um, that will unfold as we near the time of your return. And God, we do look forward to your return, um, and we're, we're excited that, um, God, you've gone to prepare a place for us. And if you go to prepare a place for us, we're confident because you promised us that you're coming back. You're going to return and you're going to take us to where you are and we can be with you forever. And that's such a, a hope-filled uh, promise that you left for us, God. But also it's a promise that we need to share with others who are still walking around in darkness and who are lost and without hope. And uh, God, face, unfortunately, face your wrath rather than your salvation. And so I just... I pray that we're faithful ambassadors and witnesses for you in the places that you've placed us here on this earth and in the, the circles and relationships that you've given us. Help us to be a light unto your gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so session 12, Revelation 15 and 16. Uh, our familiar recap slide is the outline of sort of the seven-year period, uh, Jacob's, uh, the, the 70th week in Daniel. So we, the way to look at this is sort of the stuff at the bottom is more sure, and as you go up, it becomes more and more opinion-based. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. So um, there's definitely a division line between Daniel's 70th week in Daniel. It talks about it at the, at the halfway point or the midpoint of that 77-year period. There will be this act, abomination of desolation. Jesus reiterates uh, that that moment's going to occur into the future of his day. And that's how we know that we still haven't seen that happen uh, in our world. Um, we're still anticipating that one day that, that abomination of a temple in Jerusalem um, and an Antichrist figure will arise who will proclaim himself to be God. And uh, that's, that's going to be um, uh, kicking off this period of time called the Great Tribulation, uh, the final three and a half years of um, basically God's wrath being poured out on a wicked and sinful world that continues to rebel and have a hard heart towards all the opportunities of grace that he has given to them. And so um, we, we were coming upon uh, sort of moving out of the, the mid-trib period of time, and we certainly are, are into the second three and a half years here as we're in chapters 15 and 16. We are. Thank you. Um, so in chapters 15 and 16, um, we are certainly uh, nearing uh, uh, the, the end of this second uh, three and a half year period of time. And so um, it, it's debated. I mean, you can read all kinds of opinions. Don's opinion, and, and I think there's validity to it, is that these um, bowls of God's wrath are so severe, and we'll, we'll be going through them tonight, they're so severe that there's no way that they could, they could be sustained for a long period of time. And, and there, there could be some validity to that. 
obviously. There's others who believe, have an opinion, and I, I can't disagree with them necessarily, that they won't be long-lasting judgments, that they might last a few days or a few weeks, um, and then they go away, and then the next judgment comes. So th there's differences of opinions among the scholars, and so they think of them more as, as distributed throughout that three and a half year period, um, rather than all contained within the last few weeks or even days of, of the time just before the second coming of Christ, which, which we're going to certainly see as we, we hit Revelation 19. That's where we see a clear picture of Jesus' uh, return to the earth, that his feet touch the ground, and, and we see his rule and his reign begin on earth. And so, uh, so that's where we're at in the timeline. Uh, we're somewhere if on this chart in this period of time, if not really close to the, the, um, the last half of that three and a half years. So Don, go to the next slide. Yeah. Here comes the bulls. So that's, that's the name of our, of our class tonight. Here come the bulls, and the worst is yet to come. Now, I have a friend, and many of you know her, and she's a little small Japanese woman uh, who is just running around cheerful and always encouraging everyone she sees. Her name is Sharon Tanaka. For those of you guys who don't know her, she's part of our Crossroads family here. And she signs every one of her emails with a phrase underneath her signature, and it says this, the best is yet to come. And that is true for those of us who are in Christ, right? No doubt in my mind that the best for us is not here. You know, we, we sometimes... Way of saying it is, this is the worst that's ever going to get for us. Yeah, you could look at it that way too, right? Is that, you know, right now we're living the worst life because the best is yet to come. But unfortunately, the reality for those who have rejected Jesus is this becomes true of their reality, that the worst is yet to come. And certainly as we approach the bowls, which you can actually almost, um, you, can, you can refer to them as hell on earth. We know that there's going to be a hell. Jesus taught it. Um, we're going to see it again in Revelation. There is a place designed for those who choose to reject the free gift of salvation that's found in Jesus Christ. And it's, it's a place that's separated from God for all eternity. And it's a horrible place, and it's a place that ultimately we're going to get a small glimpse into tonight of what it looks like to be separated from God's grace, um, even for a short duration here on earth. Imagine an eternity of these types of plagues that are coming up tonight. Uh, people will endure that because of their rejection of Jesus Christ. And it's, that's just tremendously sad, but it's a reality, and it's, and it's honestly... Um, it's a necessary reality for the gospel to make any sense. In other words, if we, if we just cease to be, or if we just, you know, um, went to sleep after we died, and there's no real consequence beyond that, then what's the need for a Savior? Why did Jesus go to a cross? Why did he pay the ultimate price for sin if, eh, I just die and there's no real long-lasting consequence to my, to my issue, Right? So it's an offense to the gospel for people to say there is no hell, that there is no eternal consequence to rejecting an eternal God. And that's the reality that we face as we, we come to these bold judgments, is we kind of get a glimpse of what hell looks like as these judgments and wrath is poured out. So um, we'll start at uh, Revelation 15. If you're following along, that we're going to try and cover two chapters, and we'll do our best to get through it. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. So again, where is John seeing the, the vision? Uh, is it on earth or in heaven at this point? He's seeing what's happening in this part of the vision in heaven. Seven angels with seven last plagues. Last because with them, God's wrath is completed. All right, so it begs a few questions. First question is, if his wrath is completed with these seven last plagues, when did it begin? Right? That's certainly a question that should come to mind. But also, what does it mean that God's wrath is completed? Well, um, when you go to that, go ahead, uh, Don, you can go to the next slide. This word completed is the Greek word teleos. And teleos is the same word that Jesus used on the cross. It's the root word of what he said when he hung on the cross. And you might remember when he was on that cross before he gave up his spirit. He, uh, he uttered these words. It is finished, right? What is finished? Well, 
you can debate that, right? Well, his work for God on earth was finished. Well, that's true. But what was ultimately finished? God's wrath was satisfied in his sacrifice on that cross. All the sin for all humanity for all time was laid on him. And in his body, he bore the penalty of sin and death. In his body, he bore that. And so that, that journey that he took to that moment where God looked on him and said, it, what you just did, that satisfies it. That, there's a propitiation. It's a fancy word that's used, right? That, that God's wrath is satisfied in Christ Jesus. And so if, if God's wrath was satisfied in that moment, then why is there still wrath? Because not everybody has accepted that moment. And so, unfortunately, if you do accept that moment, God's wrath is satisfied for your sins in Christ. But if you reject that moment, God's wrath still stands on you and on your head for your sins. And that's why God's wrath has to continue. And that's why God's wrath comes to completion here in Revelation chapter 15 and 16, as he doles out this wrath on those that have refused to accept the the free gift of salvation that's found in Jesus Christ our Lord. Does that make some sense? So we have, um, teleos is also the word that Jesus uses in Matthew 5, verse 48, where he says, be perfect or be completed just as your heavenly father is perfect or complete. Do you remember in um, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Do you remember where it says that? Well, what that means is that we are, we are basically um, a work of art that God is shaping throughout our lives to accomplish something that he wants to bring us into completion, right? To bring us into the fullness of the image of Christ Jesus it, it, and, and be that type of individual. That's what sanctification is all about in the Christian life, right? We are to crucify the flesh, and we are to be crucified with Christ, right? We are to be new creations in Christ Jesus. And so it's a journey, right? Anybody struggle with that journey as I do? We all do, right? Um, and so, so when, when we hear these words, be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. By the way, who spoke those words? Jesus himself spoke those words, right? And that sounds like, well, is he calling us to do everything right, and that's how we get to be with God? No, he's saying be complete in your faith and in the work that God wants to have done in your life. Allow God to do that. Allow God to perfect you with his power and with his uh, process, right? You're not going to be able to be perfect on your own, and Jesus never told you to be, right? But you can be a finished work of art. Does that make sense? And that's what Jesus wants us to strive towards. And that's where this word, this word teleos, is this idea of bringing things to completion or to a finished process, a completed process. So that's Greek. It is Greek. Um, you can go back one, one Don. So at the very bottom, teleos means perfected, completed, or brought to a fulfillment or a fullness. All right, so go ahead, next one. The wrath of God, now this is interesting because I, I asked a question. My question was, when did the wrath of God begin? Right? Because here it's being brought to a fullness, a completeness. He's finishing his work of pouring out the righteous wrath that sins deserve. Of course, he, be, he did that on the cross, on his own son, Jesus Christ. But for those who reject it, he's now having to finish it with these judgments that are, that are uh, displayed to us in Revelation. So when did it begin? Well, this is Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18. Paul writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And we're going to skip down to verse 32. Listen to this. Although they knew, they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things, and he gives a whole list of debauchery and, and, and doing things that are wicked and sinful, 
they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Right? So when did God's wrath begin? It began when sin, when human began to sin. That's when his wrath began. So here's the interesting reality. God's wrath against sin began in the very beginning, but his grace also began in the very beginning. And we see that dynamic of his wrath and his grace being played out throughout human history. And now we come to the end, and what's interesting is, you know, it seems like there's less and less opportunity for grace because the wrath is becoming more and more built up and ready to be poured out on this earth. And so the wrath of God, and one thing I thought that was interesting is if you read through Romans and you, you take your time, I don't have time to, to, you know, to break that down, but he talks about that he gave them over. Do you remember that where the passage says he gave them over to a reprobate, reprobate mind. He gave them over to their own lusts. He gave them over to, to where they were doing horrible, wicked things, right? That is part of his wrath. That is part of his judgment. That is the outpouring of his wrath. You want to go away from me? Okay. But it's going to lead to a horrible, miserable existence. And, but I'm, I'm going to allow you to, to experience what it's like to live without me. That's wrath. Do you understand that? That God says, if you want to you wanna sin, you're going to experience the consequences of your sin. And that's God's wrath. When you experience the consequences of your sin, God's righteous wrath is being poured out into your life. Right? So let's go on to uh, our next slide. So we're on uh, back to chapter 15, verse 2. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire, and standing behind, beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name, they held harps given them by God. Oops, sir. So um, verse 2 really gives us another picture. Remember, he sees these angels coming out with these bowls out of heaven, right? But he also sees uh, a sea of glass glowing with fire. Now, this is interesting because... We have seen the sea of glass before in this book. And we're going to read about that in just a second. Uh, back in Revelation, uh, I think it's chapter, four. is it four? four? Yeah, chapter four, that sounds right. Um, and we kind of understand where the sea of glass is. You guys know where the sea of glass is? Those of you guys who have been here since Revelation four, I think that was our first week, right? <laughs> it's before the throne where the 24 elders are serving, remember? And the, and the four um, creatures are there. And there's the four living creatures, and, and it's basic, basically the, the throne room of God. So this is what John is seeing. But now there's an interesting thing. There's a fire that has appeared amongst this sea of glass. There's a, there's a raging fire there that's uh, glowing out of the sea of glass. And standing behind the sea is who? Who are these people from our study so far? And it says it right here. Martyrs. They're martyrs. They're people that have been victorious, and they're victorious because... It says they um, overcome by the word of their testimony, right? By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And so there's, there's this sense of like, these are the same group that said, how long do we have to wait before you're going to avenge our blood? You remember that? Mm -hmm. and, and back in early in Revelation, he says, a little bit longer. Stand by, it's coming. You know, and so now we're, we're seeing these people, um, you know, uh, again, and they're given harps, which is kind of interesting, right? Um, how many know how to play the harp? Anyone? <laughs> Somehow we, we miraculously get to be able to play harps in heaven. I don't know how. Okay, go on to the next slide, Don. Um, this, again, back to Revelation 4, 6. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were the four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and in back. So this gives us, again, a, an idea of where they're at. Now, notice also, um, this, this is that passage I talked about earlier where um, earlier in Revelation, we saw these people. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, uh, and remember, there's a heavenly tabernacle and a heavenly altar that exists because the one that was on earth was a copy of the heavenly reality. That's what Hebrews tells us, right? So he's seeing the heavenly reality. He's seeing that under this altar are the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they had maintained. Whether that's during the church age or during the tribulation, later on it says that these come out of the great tribulation, right? So it seems like these ones, at least, are coming out of this tribulation period. Um, 
They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? And then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. So, you know, the, the whole idea of, you know, the Antichrist and his regime continuing to ramp up the persecution of those who refused to take the mark of the beast. Remember, it's like, take the mark or what? Or die. I mean, those are your, like, two choices, right? So many are saying, no, I'd rather stay stay faithful to my Lord and my King Jesus Christ and follow your regime. And then, okay, off with their heads, you know, and they become part of this group that is um, gathered in heaven under the altar, under the heavenly altar. Um, and there's so much cool stuff that you could pull out, you know, if you understand what was happening at the altar back in the tabernacle days and, you know, the sacrifices that were being offered up to God and how pleasing they were to him and things like that. Well, this, this is what's happening with human lives in this situation. Uh, in the heavenly realm. Okay, let's move on now. And, and um, they sang the song of God's servant Moses. So these are the ones with the harps. They, somehow they know how to play a certain tune. The, uh, the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. And now what's interesting is we're going to get the song of the Lamb kind of right here. See, it's in quotes here. And we're going to get it. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the Nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. That's a good song lyric. I wonder if Nate knows the key or if uh, he can get, a, get some song composed with those lyrics. But it's in B. Okay, it's a B, B minor 7. or No, I don't, I, I don't know nothing about music, really. Yeah, so... <laughs> be flat. Um, so, so I think uh, what's cool about that is when you see this this idea of this song being sung, um, you know, God is honored by our worship. He really is. When we when we praise His name, it's not something that's just for here on earth. This is happening in heaven, right? It's something that um, we're going to continue to do even into heaven. Is this paraphrasing the song of Moses that's found in Deuteronomy? Uh, good question. We'll get that right next. I love how this guy is always a step ahead. He's a, clearly a scholar. All right. Um, go to the next slide. So here we are. Um, the song of Moses is actually given to us in the Bible. Okay. And the song of Moses happened just after the Red Sea. So the, remember they were freed. The, the, they were freed out of their slavery uh, in Egypt. The Israelites were. They were led by Moses out into the desert. But then Pharaoh changed his mind again. And he said, what were we thinking? We just gave up our entire workforce. Um, let's go get them. And so he chases them down with his army, and then God miraculously saves them through the scene that we read in the Red Sea. And this is right after that moment. It says that Moses and the Israelites sung a song of praise to God, right? And so it seems like these martyrs are singing something similar to this, if not this song, right? So let's read about it here. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver, he is hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And that, the Lord right there is Yahweh, is his name. And so there's this sense of like, um, you know, these are, these are martyrs who have basically put all of their trust in Jesus, and now he is going to appear as their defense, as their warrior, as their one who is going to avenge their blood and really kind of take care of the, the enemy, so to speak, right? And so this is kind of a cool song that these harpists, these souls that are under the altar are singing to the Lamb, to the Lord, right, is the song of Moses. Now, now my friend here mentioned uh, Deuteronomy 32, and some scholars believe that Deuteronomy 32 is predicting that the Israelites are going to basically break the covenant of God, right? They're going to um, not follow the decrees that God laid down for them in, in the book of uh, Exodus and the covenant, and they're just going to, they're going to falter, and they're going to mess it up. And so there's, there's also kind of like some things that are listed in Deuteronomy 32 that could also be referred to 
as the song of Moses, talking about God's faithfulness despite Israel's failure, right? And that, you know, we deserve what we're getting, but thank God we have a God that's faithful, and, you know, and so there's some of that language as well. So it could be either. It could be Exodus 15. It could be Deuteronomy 32, as you said. It could be something that's not even that one of those two, right? We don't know fully. It doesn't tell us the lyrics of the Song of Moses. It almost assumes, like, you're familiar with the Song of Moses, so I don't need to tell you the lyrics, right? So it probably harkens back to one of these passages that we're looking at. So, all right, we're moving on. Revelation chapter 15, did that answer your question, by the way? Okay, Revelation 15, verse 5. After this, I looked, and I saw in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was open. Now, this is kind of a cool scene, because remember what I told you about it's, it's a tabernacle literally set up in heaven. And in the place where the, the law is kept, who remembers where the law was kept in the first tabernacle? The Ark of the Covenant. It was in the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, right? Under the mercy seat, surrounded by the cherubim. Now, what's interesting is those cherubim wings, in Ezekiel 28, it says that before Satan fell, he was those cherubim wings. He was the one that was guardian over the mercy seat of, of God in heaven. That's the type of role he had. Think about it, how close he was to the most holy place and to, to God's throne. And in his heart, he said, I'm not satisfied with this. I can be this. I want this glory. And it says in his heart, he rose rebellion against God. And that's what led to a lot of the mess that we're in today, right? Um, and so uh, this is in, the, in heaven. There's a temple and he, then he clarifies, it's not necessarily a temple, it's like a tabernacle, you know. What's the difference between a temple and a tabernacle? One's portable, <laughs> one can move, right? So tabernacle, which is interesting, can heaven move? I don't know. Like, maybe, maybe it moves around. I don't know what's going on up there. But this is what it says it is, right? A tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was open. So let's keep going. Verse 6, out of the temple came the seven angels. So here they come, they're open, they're walking out of the, the holy place. With what? with the seven plagues, almost like bowls they're carrying with the authority to unleash plague on the earth, to unleash these final judgments and wrath that, that these people rightfully deserve because they haven't accepted the other one who satisfied the wrath of God, Jesus Christ. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chest. That's a priestly garb, by the way. You know, that's it's very similar to what the priests wore. Out of the, um, oh, I'm sorry. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. Verse 8, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. This is a very interesting verse. And you know why? Because it says no one could enter the temple during the time of the plagues. Well, guess who serves in the temple in heaven? The Bible tells us it's Jesus Christ, the high priest. He's the one that goes and intercedes on behalf of mankind. He pleads for us before the Father. He is even banished during these plagues. No one's allowed in, which tells us something. There is no grace that's going to fall during this period of time. It's only going to be wrath. Right? Because the grace of God comes from the fact that Christ intercedes for us, that he pleads for us, that he says, God, I know that they deserve this, but please give them more time. Please give them more chances. And God at this point saying, it's, it's, it's my wrath needs to come to completion. My wrath needs to come to a final point. And so I'm closing up the temple. Nobody's allowed in, not even my son Jesus. It's a very harsh thing that we hear here, right? The last seven plagues are going to be poured out. And until they're completed, no one could enter the temple. No one. All right, let's look at the smoke uh, idea. Oh, So I, I'm just going to go through a quick verse, uh, Hebrews 9, 23, 24. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. He's talking about all the sacrifices of blood that come from the bulls and the rams and the different things that were sacrificed in the Old Testament. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. He didn't enter the one that was on earth. That was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself and now to appear for us in God's presence. This is the idea that he's the high priest 
Uh, Hebrews talks about that. Hebrews articulates that in other parts of the book. And uh, he lives to intercede. He lives to offer sacrifice on our behalf. Well, that, that's been shut down, it's seemingly, here in the final seven bowls. Uh, next verse, Don. Exodus 19.18, a couple of verses where we see smoke descend on the earth. Mount Sinai was covered with what? Smoke. Because why? Because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. When God's presence takes hold of a place, it's a very frightful thing, right? Isaiah chapter 6, he has that same experience when he, when he encounters the, the throne room of God. Uh, the next verse, I think, is uh, verse chapter 20. When the people saw the thunder and the lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, what, how did they react? They trembled with fear and they stayed at a distance. They even told like Moses, you go up and, and deal with things. We're going to stay right here. Thank you very much. Right? So it's very intimidating that when God's presence comes in a powerful way, in a moment where he is making something very clear um, about what he wants done. And so, um, therefore, I will make the heavens tremble. This is in Isaiah. And the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the days of his burning anger. So we see that, you know, uh, the wrath of God is no light thing. The wrath of God has been predicted to come onto this earth through all the prophets but also now we're reading in the last book of the Bible more detail about this wrath. Um, Zephaniah 1.17, I will bring such distress on all people that they will grope about like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole earth will be consumed for he will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. It's pretty, that's pretty like dogmatic, right? I mean, nobody's going to do well that's going through this period of time. Hey, Matt? Yes? When it said that the uh, whole earth will be shaken from its place, uh, that possibly be that the whole world taken out of its orbit around the sun? Possibly. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, we know we know from some of the things that are going to happen that the sun is still present in the in the Earth's existence, but it does become very um, one of the bowls that we're going to look at is the sun becomes exceedingly hot and scorches the Earth. So maybe it does rotate and wobble in its orbit because of the, the power of God. We don't we don't have that detail, but you could speculate. That's a good question. All right. So uh, here come the bowls. We're going to start diving into chapter 16 now, and we're looking at bowl number one, ugly, festering sores. Who likes sores and mosquito bites and, and all kinds of you know, skin disease and problems? None of us do, right? And yet um, you know, it's one way to get our attention, right? When, when we're suffering with something like that, it just we can't get our mind out. We want, we want healing. We want like, you know, to be that remedy. We don't want to keep suffering in that condition. And, and again, God seems to be like telling people, like trying to get their attention, you know, and just say, hey, you, you guys need to repent of your ways and, and turn from your wickedness. And so he sends these things almost like in Exodus when he sent the plagues into Egypt and tried to get Pharaoh to see his power and change his heart, right? Same kind of thing starting to take place. So let's start at Revelation 16, 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying, to the seven angels, go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly, festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. This is kind of an interesting statement, isn't it? Because it's just like in Egypt, are the sores on everybody on earth, or are they on a certain demographic of people? Right. And so those who are following the agenda of Satan seem to be consumed with these sores and these problems, and uh, maybe they took the, uh, the beast injection. I don't know. Uh, maybe the, uh, yeah. And now these are the side effects. I don't know what's going on here, right? But the reality is whatever is happening here, it's only affecting, it seems like miraculously, those that are a part of his agenda and his plan. And those that haven't, 
they're probably trying to hide. They're probably trying to like, you know, stay away because, or maybe they haven't been reached because they're on some primitive island that the beast doesn't care about yet. He hasn't really got his message out to them. But the reality is like, there's a lot of people suffering with this first play. But they can't repent. It's already too late for them. So I'm kind of like going. Well, they can repent. They can repent. Well, yeah, but the reality is you can repent anytime you, you want to well, repent. Do any good. Wow. So yeah. the question is, could Pharaoh have repented at any time? Or, you know, at what point did he harden his heart so much that God just allowed it to continue to be? God hardened his heart. Right. At some point, yeah, but he hardened his heart for a long time, and then eventually it says God hardened his heart. Right? And we don't, we don't see the human heart, only God can. And so the reality is God makes that judgment in each one of the individual situations. And so I do think, because we're going to see that they are called to repentance or there's an expectation from God and from you know uh, his vantage point that their response should be repentance. Their response, but they refuse to do it. We're going to see that throughout this. So whether or not, whether or not they can or not, I don't know. But the reality is God says they won't, right? Yes. So, yeah. so they they're don't deluded. know yeah, that they can repent. Yeah. So it, there is a spiritual condition, right? Just like the Jews today don't see the Messiah because they've been their you know eyes have been darkened. At some point, he's going to lift that veil, right? Well, only the mercy and grace of God can lift the veil. So, but I do think God responds to a heart that says, "God, I'm sorry," right? Both today and into the future. We have the same God yesterday, today, and forever. But the reality is God knows the human heart. And if people don't come to him through, let me ask you this. What leads us to repentance according to scripture? Is it God's wrath? Or is it God's kindness leads us to repentance? That's what the scriptures say. God's kindness leads us to repentance, right? If they didn't lead to repentance through God's kindness, doubtful they're going to come to repentance through his wrath, right? And that's really the situation here. So, the first angel went, poured out his bowl, and these ugly festering sores break out. And let's take a look at this a little bit. Now, these shingles, right? That's the, they are the shingles. It's possible. Whatever it is, man, you know, I've... My friend has shingles. It's all over her face. It's her my, my poor wife had it. It was horrible. So, yeah, it's not good. So, then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on earth. Now, this is just a little bit rewind. This is back to chapter 14, right? What's happening on earth during chapter 14? Right here, what does this say? The earth is receiving what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. They're getting opportunity. They're getting the opportunity for grace right before wrath. But what does it say? It says they, it's to proclaim to those who live on earth, uh, what does it say, Don? To every nation, tribe, language, and people. That says it's all-encompassing. Everybody's being covered with the gospel of Jesus Christ, Right? So how do they respond? He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of judgment has come. It's like, you know, when you tell your kid, like, you better obey or, you know, next thing is you're getting a spanking, right? They know what's coming and they have an opportunity in that moment to choose the right choice, right? Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea and the springs of water. But the reality is we know they didn't respond because if they would have responded to this moment, they wouldn't be finding themselves in that moment we're reading about now. Does that make sense? Right. All right. So Exodus 9, this, this, all these bowls are somewhat reminiscent of what happened in Exodus. So we're going to take a look at some of these comparisons. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from a furnace and have Moses toss it into the air in the presence of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over the whole land of Egypt with festering boils. So maybe they're boils. It will break out on people and animals throughout the land. So they took soot from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. Moses tossed it into the air, and festering boils broke out on all the people and the animals. The magicians couldn't even stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Here's where you guys see that, right? And he would not listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had said to Moses. So yes, there is a moment where God knows that you have rejected him. You've forfeited those moments of grace that he's provided into your life because you just continue to harden your heart. And at some point he goes, okay, I'm going to lock that in. I'm going to harden your heart and you're going to go through it, right? And so that's, that's what's happening here to Pharaoh. 
and we know it can also happen to people in the last days. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, 15. This is interesting because this passage of Scripture is, is what's called the blessings and curses of the covenant, right? So Moses tells the people, he lines them all up before he's about to die, and Joshua's going to take him into the promised land after he dies. And he said, all right, here, God, here's the deal, guys. If you guys obey the terms of this covenant, you're going to be blessed. And here's all the blessings you're going to receive. But if you disobey the terms of this covenant, you're going to receive the cursings that are in, contained within, right? And you guys know the story. Did the Israel, were they faithful to the covenant? How many have read Hosea, where God tells Hosea to go marry a prostitute, an unfaithful woman, because that's how Israel has treated him? Right? So right here we go. Um, the Lord will, okay, so this is Deuteronomy 28, 15. However, if you do not obey the, the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. What's one of those curses? Skip down to verse 27. The Lord will afflict you with boils, the boils of Egypt, and with tumors, festering sores, and the itch. How many like the itch? from which you cannot be cured. Now, when will unfaithful Israel receive this curse? I would say at the bowl number one. Whatever Israelites that are on the earth that are continue to have a hard heart in this moment, they're going to receive the effects of the covenant that was written way back in Deuteronomy. Does that make sense? God is faithful to keep his promises, whether they're good promises or... Unfortunately, these types of, you know, not so good promises. Curses. But, but in a weird way, the Israelites should wake up and go, oh, man, that was written in the covenant, and now we're experiencing it. God is real, and he's faithful to his promises. If he's faithful to keep these bad ones, maybe we should realize he's going to be faithful to keep the good ones, and we should turn to him, right? That's what they should be thinking. Here comes the bulls. Number two and three are water turning to blood. That sounds kind of familiar, right? Let's read about it. Uh, verse 3, the second angel poured out his bowl onto the sea, that's the salt water, and it turned into blood like that of a dead person. And every living thing in the sea died. That's a pretty nasty play. Can you imagine the stench? The fish washing up on shore all dead. Everything in the whole sea is, yeah, it's bad. I mean, I, I can't imagine that. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs. So now we're into the freshwater supply, right? Rivers, springs uh, of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, O Holy One, you who are and who were. For they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord. True and just are your judgments. It's interesting because, um, you know, in this situation, uh, we're, we're seeing something that we've already seen in the trumpet judgments, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to flash back to that and see it, what we saw in Revelation 8. The second angel, it's interesting, second, bowl, second angel of the bowl, second angel of the trumpet, sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures of the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Um, the third angel <coughs> sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and of the springs of water. Right? And then it says the name of the star is Wormwood. I've been looking for Wormwood. Have you? Um, a third of the, if somebody says, like, an asteroid named Wormwood is headed our way, <laughs> I say, come Lord Jesus, right? So a third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. So in this case, in the trumpet case, how much of the, the springs and the, and the sea were affected, according to the Bible? It was just a portion, right? Now in the bowls, we're seeing everything. We're seeing such a more massive scale, a massive like intensity of this judgment being poured out, right? And so... Um, now, some say, and, and Don's right, if, if this is true that all water on Earth is pretty much contaminated, uh, how long are you going to last as a human race? Well, according to what science says, isn't it three days or something? We can go without water or something. Uh, so not very long, right? Now, there might be some storage stuff. There might, 
But but yeah, there's other well, there's other thoughts, and I've had these thoughts myself that this doesn't last for the whole duration of the thing. That eventually it cleanses itself or it comes back to life. It doesn't say that here, but in my thought process, I'm like, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be permanent. It could be a phase, one of many judgments that's being poured out in a sequential order where it lasts for a couple of weeks or whatever, and people are about to run out of water, and then it is repurified by whatever's happening on the earth. So it's possible, right? So just like we still don't go to the Nile River and see blood, that eventually got cleansed, right? The one-third of the waters that turned to blood, were they still blood, or had they been cleansed since? And did they return back to oceans and springs and rivers? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Maybe they stayed blood, and now the rest of the two-thirds are turning to blood. But we read that it says all of the waters was turned to blood from this judgment. So we know that's true. Right? We just don't know the duration. Um, so it's possible that the duration is permanent. In that case, it would be very hard for humanity to go much longer. Right? And so that's where Don kind of comes up with his viewpoint that it's got to be right at the very end, right before the return of Christ. And if, if that's the case, i got to agree with him. But I kind of wonder if it has to be that way, just, just personal. So um, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. Remember those uh, angels that are, are basically echoing, like, God, you're judging like this severe, but you're righteous in doing it. And this is why you're righteous, because they shed the blood of the prophets, and now they should drink from that. Right? So there's almost like an eye for an eye. You ever heard of eye for an eye? Who invented the, the concept of eye for an eye? God did. Does that mean he made a mistake? When Jesus came on the scene, did he correct God, the Father? Or did he just almost like up the bar? He said, you've heard eye for an eye, but I tell you the truth. Right? And then he, he kind of raised the bar on even the, the basic requirement of eye for an eye. And so, so God's justice is, is eye for an eye justice. You know, you kill the prophets, you're going to drink the blood. You know, so that's, his ways are righteous, and his, he's faithful in all he does. Let's go on to the next. Uh, God's justice, giving us what our sins deserve. That's really what wrath and justice is all about. Getting what our sins deserve. Who wants what their sins deserve? Raise your hand. I don't, right? Grace is not getting what our sins deserve. That's exactly what the definition of grace is. Thankfully, God is both gracious and loving and compassionate, but he's also a God of justice and jealous and filled with wrath at evil and sin and things that rebel against his authority, right? So when we get God's justice, we get what our sins deserve. What are some examples of God's justice in the Bible? I'm going to go through a few. Eye for an eye principle of, of God's justice. Pharaoh filled the Nile River with baby's blood. Remember the boys? That he said, kill them and throw them in the Nile, the Nile River. God turned that very river into blood. Right? There's eye for eye justice against Pharaoh. Pharaoh drowned Jewish babies in the Nile River. So God drowned Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. There's eye for an eye justice. Haman, remember that dude? Yeah. Yeah. Book of Esther. He planned to hang Mordecai on the gallows and exterminate the Jews. But God had Haman hung on his own gallows. <coughs> You know, you build gallows to kill my people, you're going to hang on them, right? Eye for an eye justice. King Saul, he refused to obey God and slay the Amalekites, as God told him to do, as the king of Israel. He said, no, I'm not going to obey that command. I don't want to do that. So what, how did his end, uh, life end? King Saul was slain by an Amalekite. You know, you don't want to follow what I'm telling you to do? Well, that's going to come back to bite you, right? Eye for an eye justice. Here comes the bulls, bull number four, scorching sun. If we haven't had enough yet, you got festering boils, you got all kinds of blood in your water supply. Now you go to the fourth angel. The fourth angel poured out his bull on the sun. And as Dennis said earlier, we don't know if the earth is wobbling at this point in its orbit or how this is happening, but, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. Um, they were seared by the intense heat. Anybody ever had a really bad sunburn? And just how, how much it hurts the day after. Like you don't even want to be touched. You don't even want to sleep in your bed. You're like, ah, oh, it so hurts. Can you imagine being completely just seared by the sun, your skin and, and everything? And they curse the name of God. Good response, people. You know, it's not, not anything to do with our lifestyle. It's God's fault. And you didn't even believe in God before, and now you're cursing him. 
who had control over the plagues, but they refused to repent. Here's to Sue's point. You know, why aren't they repenting? They refuse to repent. God has an expectation. Respond to my wrath with repentance. Respond to it. And they're not. They're not. They're refusing and to glorify him. Malachi 4.1, surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant, every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. Here comes the bride, bowl number five. I almost said bride, didn't I? Here comes the bride. The bride's not coming yet. The bridegroom, he's coming later. Um, here comes the bowl number five, darkness. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. Here's where we get some evidence that maybe... As Don suggested, they're in rapid succession because bowl number one was what? The sores. And they still have them, right? They're still suffering for some sort of sores, and they refuse to repent of what they had done. Again, the Bible tells us there's an expectation to repent. Why aren't you repenting? Why aren't you bowing your knee? Because their heart is so desperately set against God. They're wicked, and they refuse to repent. Verse uh Revelation 9, 1 and 2, this is also related to the fifth angel that blew his trumpet. Listen to what it says. Fifth angel sounded his trumpet. I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Remember that place? The place that the devil comes out of? When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it, and the smoke, like a smoke from a gigantic furnace, and the sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. So we have, you know, these trumpets and the bowls. There seems to be a lot of correlation. Some people think that they're, you know, the same kind of thing being further explained. Others say, no, there's two separate events. I think I, I tend to think personally they're two separate events, right? Because there's different details that don't seem to perfectly line up, um, which seem to contradict each other. Uh, but I can't be dogmatic about that. There's certainly good scholars that actually go, no, they're, it's just an expansion of what's happening during the trumpet judgment. These bowls are just re-describing things on a deeper level. So um, I'll leave that with you guys to discern. But the reality is a lot of these trumpet ones seem to be a little bit minor compared to the bowls, right? In this case, we have a little bit of darken. In the case of the bowl, we have, like, complete darkness. But what's interesting is where is the darkness? Did you catch that on the bowl judgment? The darkness was in their kingdom, right? Which... Some scholars think that's their headquarters, right, which we're going to look at later was likely in a town or a city called Babylon, and it's likely that their headquarters have been completely darkened, not necessarily the whole world in this state, but who knows, because their kingdom could be the whole world, and it's all darkened. So um, there's, there's debate about that. All right, so where are we at? Exodus 10. Remember one of the plagues was darkness? Do you guys remember what plague number it was? Nate, trivia. What plague number was darkness? Nine is correct. Good job, Nate. It's the one right before, right before the ultimate one, right? And so what's interesting is we're, we're coming right up against the ultimate judgment that's about to fall as we're here on bowl number five. So in Exodus 10, this is uh, um, the ninth plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt. Darkness that can be felt. Have you guys ever been in that kind of darkness? Yes. Yeah. I've been in some really dark places where you can't even, it's so disconcerting because you can't have light. I mean, I just pull out my flashlight or something, but, you know, if you had to stay in that, you don't feel like you can move because you're going to, like, run into something or fall off a cliff, right? So you don't want to go anywhere. So Moses stretched out his hand towards the sky, and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Yet all the Israelites had what? Light, Light in the places where they lived. I, I think of it as maybe God miraculously has Israel still have light, and here's Babylon under complete darkness, right? Uh, we don't know for sure, but there, it makes me wonder, right? Uh, and there's this contrast that you can either have the light of Israel's God or you can have the Antichrist darkness in your life. You choose. You know, and these people are like, we've been following the Antichrist. We're going to continue to do it. You know, we hate Israel. So, so five doesn't say how long the darkness. No. 
we don't get lengths in any of these bowls, which is frustrating on one level, because I wish I said for four days and two nights or something. I don't know if that is possible, but um, four days and three nights. Yes. In the Old Testament. Oh, even for the plagues? Yeah, I don't think... Well, no, the plague said it lasted for three days. Oh, three days, okay. So the plague said three days, the bowl doesn't say time frame. So we're left to speculate, is it similar to the plague? Is it different than the plague? You know, we don't know. No one could see anyone else, oh, so I already read that. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I just showed that. Yeah. Okay, we're at number six, and hopefully we're getting close here. That's good. Bowl number six. The sixth angel pulled out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way of the kings from the east. Now, on one hand, I'm going to stop right there real yeah. quick. On one hand, that sounds like a minor judgment compared to all these other things that have just happened, right? But what you need to understand is why is God doing this particular judgment? at this particular time. So let's keep reading. Well, interesting point. The river Euphrates is now a river again. So maybe you're right about the blood not lasting in the water. Yes, or the river is blood and it just dries up. up anyway. yeah. There's, I've read that too, thinking like, I'm going to prove Don wrong and I couldn't do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> the sixth, uh, so verse 13. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Who are those three? The unholy, yep, the devil, his antichrist, and his false, the false prophet, right? So these three are, are conspiring to do something together. That's what I want you to take away from that verse. Keep going. They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. So what are they doing? They're going out to convince the kings, you guys need to come and fight. You guys need to come and, and, and we need to go after Israel, right? There's some sort of like desire on the part of the kings to go, yeah, this whole thing is their fault, right? And so they, they join in this force. But the reality is Satan knows his time is short. Satan knows that Jesus has predicted through the scriptures, which he can read, by the way, that he's going to come and he's going to be on the set his feet on the Mount of Olives, right? Where is, where is that? It's in East Jerusalem. I've been there, right? He's going to be there, and the devil knows that this is about to happen, so he's bringing up every possible military force to fight against God when he arrives. Because the devil's like, I am still can win. I still can win. Have you ever met anybody that like just doesn't know when, when enough is enough? I have a son. He's 13. Same thing. <laughs> Ask, ask his mom. Look, look. I mean, I have him completely whooped, and he just won't give up. All right. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who come, who stays awake and remains clothed so as to not go naked and be shamefully exposed. So in the midst of this judgment, there is a warning given for anyone who is, I guess, at this moment, right? I guess, like, in this, or, or like, leading up to this time, right, there's this idea of, like, Hey, I'm going to come when, you're, when you don't expect it. I'm coming back. And you need to stay awake. And you need to remain clothed or, or remain like, you know, the, remember where it says put on the clothes or the put on the things. Uh, well, it says take off the old clothes and put on the new clothes that God wants to give us. And you can read it. I think it's Colossians. Nate, do you remember that one? Somewhere in there. All right, no more questions. So as to not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, now that literally is Har Megiddo, right? Which in English is translated Armageddon, but like Har Megiddo means Mount Megiddo, right? Now Megiddo means the it means the uh, place of destruction, right? That's the literally translation of Megiddo, the place of destruction or place of warriors. So let's uh, go on. Joel, chapter 3, I want to read some verses from this. Proclaim this among the nations. This has already been predicted, by the way, this battle of Armageddon, way back in the prophets in the Old Testament. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weaklings say, I am strong. Come quickly, all you nations from every side, and assemble there. Bring down your warriors, Lord. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come trample the grapes, grapes, for the wine press is full, and the vats overflow. So great is their wickedness. 
multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. So Joel predicts this moment of time when this battle begins, this war, really. It's not just like we think of a battle as like, okay, it lasts a day or a couple days. This is like a several, this is a lengthy campaign, so to speak, right? There's gathering. They got to move across the Euphrates River. They got to come from the different parts of the earth and they got to move into place. And they're, they, then they sack Jerusalem. We're going we're gonna to read a few verses about that. They start raping the women. They start doing all kinds of stuff. And it's not until the very end of all that that Jesus comes and defeats them with those of us who come with him. So here is Megiddo. I, I had the privilege to go to Israel in May, and I got to stand on Megiddo. Um, Tel Megiddo is what it's called today, which is Tel is basically like a, a hill that's being excavated, right? So it was a very interesting place with lots of history, and it was fascinating to be there. But this is on the bus ride. I took a quick picture of Megiddo. It's that way. <laughs> All right. And this is when I got into the National Park, there was a sign, Welcome to Tel Megiddo National Park. And this is sitting inside the fortress walls of the ancient Megiddo. And it's looking out into the valley of what? What do you think? Decision. The valley of Jehoshaphat. The Jezreel Valley. It has many names, right? But that's the Jezreel Valley. And the next picture that I gave, that is the Jezreel Valley. That is the valley that this, this depicted moment is going to happen, where all of these nations gather and the armies and forces. And this is only about 20 miles from Jerusalem. It's just north of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is at 3,500 feet. This is about at sea level. So to get to Jerusalem from here, you've got to march up. You've got to take your troops up the hills and into Jerusalem. Right? So it's a very interesting thing. The valley is about 20 miles long, about 12 miles wide. Napoleon said it was the most beautiful battlefield he'd ever seen. Uh, uh, all the different, um, uh, I think it was, uh, I'm trying to remember what I read, but there are all these generals and different people in ancient history. When they came across this, they were like, this is a perfect battlefield. And, and it's almost like been created for that moment. Right now it has farms. It's like, you know, occupied by farmers and different people in Israel. And it's a beautiful place, as you can see. But the, it was kind of cloudy and smoggy or something. I couldn't, the visibility wasn't great from there. And honestly, the idea that it's a mountain is kind of a misnomer. It's like, it's like 200 feet tall, right? So it's not very much of a mountain. It's like a little, little mountain. But it is, it is a fortress. It was like an ancient fortress. It's right along a road where there was all kinds of travel taking place. So it's a very uh, interesting position place to be at like the, you know, this is where everybody's going to pass through. And so it's positioned there. All right. Um, and someday I'd love to show you more Israel slides, but maybe I'll just work them in as I find it in the Bible. All right. So a prophecy, the word of the Lord concerning Israel, the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth and informs the human spirit uh, within a person declares. I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over Judah, but I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. Beautiful picture, right, of this last day, Zechariah. Let me take you two chapters later in 14. A day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem, when your possession will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women's raped. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. You will flee by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. 
You will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all his, who? Who's coming with him? Well, if you're a holy one, if you're in Christ, you get to come with him. That's going to be quite a day, and we have a good vantage point. We're coming from like above. It's going to be a good view. I never got to take a helicopter ride in Israel, so I guess I'll wait for that day. it would be pretty awesome. Matthew 24, 42, 44. Remember this whole idea of he comes like a thief? Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch. He would have not let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Another uh, passage that emphasizes that is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the darkness, so this day should not surprise you like a thief. You are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like the others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. And finally, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. What promise? The promise to return. As some understand slowness, instead he's being patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. In Revelation chapter 3, to the angel of the church of Sardis, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation to be alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out their na the name of the person from the book of life. It's almost like, hey, your, your name's already been written. Only Jesus has the right to blot it out. How is he going to blot it out? Well, if you reject his free gift. That's the sad part. Think about that. Every person's name's in there which kind of helps me when I think about children who die too young or when I think about innocent, you know, mentally disabled people who have passed away. Their name's already in there. God's not going to blot it out because they're not guilty of their sin. They didn't even know about it. But those who refuse to, to repent of their sin, those are the ones who, unfortunately, their names are blotted out. But will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Verse 6, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. To who? Churches. So it's relevant to you and I, is it not? These warnings that are given in the Bible. All right, we come to the conclusion of our time together. It's bowl number seven. And it's God's wrath completed. The greatest earthquake in human history and the biggest hailstones I've ever heard about are about to hit the earth. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and the, out of the temple came a loud voice in the throne saying, it is done. Kind of similar to that whole idea of on the cross, right? It is finished. That means the wrath is coming to a conclusion here. Um, the wrath is going to be satisfied. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. It's the type of quake that I imagine would level things all across the earth. You know, just like cities just being completely leveled. Tons of people dying. Right? Just mass casualties. And a world that's already experienced all this other turmoil, now they're kind of mad at the Antichrist and his regime. They're mad at Israel. They're just mad at everything. They're just like ready to, fine, I'm just going to go fight. What do I have left? You know? Then, uh, the, uh, let's see. The great city split into three parts. Now there's debate about what the great city is. Earlier in Revelation, it says the great city is what? Jerusalem. So some think this is Jerusalem. It's split into three parts. Others think, because of what is referenced right after this, and the cities of the nation collapsed, 
God remembered Babylon the Great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Some think that the great city mentioned here is Babylon rather than Jerusalem because of the context. Um, but we don't have, I can't be dogmatic either way. But the reality is a great city is going to be split. Maybe Don has in, uh, insight on that. That no, may you're come. right. There's, there's, it's divided. The yeah. I've even heard Rome being the great city that somehow has, is housing the, the harlot that Don's mm -hmm. going to speak about next week, um, being the great city that's, that's devastated here. But we don't know for sure. Um, verse 20. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. It's almost like God redoes the earth a little bit, like similar to the flood. Um, from the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds. Could you imagine a 100-pound hailstone? I mean, if you didn't die in the earthquake, you're going to be in trouble when these start hitting you, right? It's like such mass casualties, such mass devastation and destruction. It's like, who's left? Well, obviously there's somebody left because we're going to read about the battle continues of Armageddon, and, and it comes to a climax in Revelation 19. Um, okay, we're not, we're, and they curse God. Oh, so this is a nice response. You know, let's not repent of our sin. Let's not beg for forgiveness and mercy. Let's curse God on account of the plague of the hail, because the plague was so terrible. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky. So this was uh, plague number six, by the way. So that the hail will fall all over Egypt on people and animals and everything growing in the fields of Egypt. When Moses stretched out his staff towards the sky, the Lord set thunder and hail. Lightning flashed down the ground, so the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. Hail fell and lightning flashed back and forth. It was the worst storm in the land of Egypt since it had become a nation. Throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both people and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields, stripped every tree. The only place it did not hail was the land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. <laughs> Will God do the same thing in this final bold judgment? Um, possibly. Right? We have a pattern from the book of Exodus that seems to be repeated, not just in the land of Egypt, but now around the world. Right? or at least in the Middle East on a, on a large scale. right? So um, this is... All right, Leviticus. Why does God um, rain down stones, hailstones, on these blasphemous people? Well, let's find out in his law what he says about blaspheming. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be put to death. The entire assembly must stone them. Whether they're foreigner or native-born, when they blaspheme the name, they are to be put to death. God, again, is, is, is instituting his eye for an eye judgment, which is righteous judgment coming from God. But now he's doing the stoning with hail. And it's, uh, it's on a bunch of blasphemers, is it not? People that have refused to repent. Uh, Revelation 6. This is interesting. This is the one I'm going to leave you guys with, all right? And this is why I struggle with this whole concept of the seals first, then the trumpets, then the bowls. Let me, let me read this for you. Revelation 6. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. Who's the he? The angel. Nope. Oh, Jesus. Yes, Jesus opens the seal, right, on the, on the scroll. There was a great earthquake. Did we just read about that? Uh, maybe this is a different earthquake. Well, let's keep reading. The sun turned black. Oh, that's interesting. There was darkness. Okay, like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. Keep reading. And the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs dropped from a fig tree shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up in every mountain and island. Oh, I just read about mountain and island being removed from their place. That's interesting. Um, keep reading. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They're chickens. They called to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So whether or not the sixth seal is being further articulated with these events or whether it's a completely separate thing, you can make that decision. Um, I tend to think, like I told you guys early on in this, in this study, that I believe the seals unveil over human history from the time of John and Jesus Christ forward those seals are being slowly unveiled on this planet. And when we get to the sixth seal, obviously we're getting close to the end, right? And we see more detail of that when we read about the bowl of judgments. We see the sixth seal kind of come into full view, right? 
Um, that's just my like take on it, and Don has a totally different opinion of that, yeah. and that's great because we love each other and we can disagree on certain things. Um, and Don will explain his next week if he wants to go back to it. Um, but uh, but that's what I see is kind of the seals sort of unfolding some of the other things that take place in Revelation, and some of the seals could have happened prior to the final seven years in my my humble opinion. So um, anyway. Uh, questions. Here we are. We're at the end. Yes. Exactly. I'm a dog guy. He's a cat guy. I mean, just, somehow we're still brothers in Christ. When they're referencing that the grapes are ripe, uh, is that referencing the season of the grape harvest, which would be in October, September? Actually, it's in July. July. Late July, July August. I kind of shifts it. around. It depends on how far you want to take that analogy of the grapes, I think. But uh, I think the, the, the surface reading is the grapes are those that are basically going to be squeezed out, you know, and, and punished for their, you know. It's just an analogy of the people on earth that are going to go into the wine press of God's wrath. Uh, but it could be deeper than that, certainly. I mean, we see that throughout Scripture that he plants clues of things that, you know, sometimes we don't I, always I think it's strictly symbolic. It's just like grapes are harvested. The grapes of the wrath of God are going to be harvested. and They're going to be growing, they're going to ripen, and then they're going to be harvested at some point. I think Revelation 14, we, we looked a little bit at the harvest of judgment potentially in Revelation 14 uh, last time. So, so when they reference Jesus as a lamb, that's Passover. That's a specific yeah. time of the year. Yeah. And so a lot of this, you know, they'll, they'll specifically talk about the wheat harvest. People are I think that's why you can dig into the scriptures deeper and try and find things like that. And, and as you do, you share them with others and bounce them off them to see if you're a heretic or if you're kind of on the right track. Because that it is. It's, it's challenging well, to be have a deep conviction about something that's that obscure. You know what I mean? I mean, most prophecy people will uh, acknowledge the fact that Jesus fulfilled the spring feast that is first coming and will fulfill his uh, the fall feast that is second coming. The question is, there are some feasts that are not really talked about in Leviticus. You, where they're revealed more as you read extra biblical sources like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Talmud, stuff like that. Now you're talking about what we just talked about. Right. So, uh, so I'm not going to get into that, but my, my point is, is that, so there are some spring feasts that have already been fulfilled. There's fall feasts that are going to be fulfilled that the, during the second coming of Jesus. The question is, are there other feasts that might be find fulfillment at some point? And that's an area that well, is a larger... My, res my response to Don open. was simply this. If God wanted us to know, why didn't he put it in the scripture? Why did he put in these extra biblical sources? His counter to that was, well, maybe he wanted those discoveries to happen in the final days with the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1950 or thereabout, and we're getting these final clues in the final days. So there's always like a, a retort to somebody's challenge about like, well, I'm going to stick to this book and what it says and not yeah. go into extra biblical sources to, to build my theology or my timeline. Well, you don't, you never, so you, I agree with what you just said. You always base your beliefs on the scripture, right. but you can allow extra biblical sources to it's help you understand form. what they were trying to say because for, for centuries we have used Josephus, we've used the Talmud to help us understand what the things things were like in Jesus' day and in the Apostles' day and so forth. Yeah. And so there's nothing wrong with allowing things to potentially shed light, but you never want to build doctrine on any extra biblical source. You always want to make sure you're scripturally uh, based. Absolutely. Yes, Dennis? Uh, I believe that uh, things that are understood out of people who will not be planted and people who are put into the one person. That seems to be the analogy that's given to us. And from that wine press comes God's bowl of the wrath. And the bowl of the wrath is what is planted to Babylon at the end of days. Possible. Anyone else? You guys uh, feel like you um, are getting a better grasp of Revelation, or is it getting more cloudy? <laughs> <laughs> Because our whole, I know that Don and I's goal is so that you guys, we're not the end all of Revelation. I'll just be the first to say that. Like, 
we hope to just present it in a fashion that helps you kind of like begin to uh, understand it a little more clearly and hopefully be, begin a process of further study as you move forward in your, in your life with God. Um, and, you know, to be honest, like I think it's helpful to understand that these things are really going to take place, you know, and have a conviction about that because it motivates us to be more, uh, what do you call that, like motivated, more um, like in urgently trying to um, tell others that they need Jesus. You know, because I think that's one application that we can take away from a study in Revelations is, man, why aren't we being more busy with our work as, as witnesses in this world for Jesus? And, and could we take, could we make the most of opportunities that we've let pass by, you know, or that we've not taken advantage of where we felt like in a moment we were given an opportunity to share more about our faith and we just backed down for fear or for whatever reason. Um, and, uh, and I think that we need to be more bold as witnesses for Jesus not necessarily, although if you're called to this, go for it. Because, but I'm not talking about people that hold up signs and yell at people to repent. Um, maybe that you're a John the Baptist, and that's between you and God if that's your way you're called to. But, but just being a loving and, and gentle witness, being salt and light in environments where we're given opportunity to share about our faith. So, um, and I know it can be difficult because we live in a hostile world. And uh, if we out ourselves too much, that might mean more persecution. And none of us love that. But, uh, but isn't it worth it to save some people from this destiny? You know, isn't our embarrassment or our misfortune of being a little more heavily persecuted in this world um, worth opening our mouth a little more often about who our Savior is and that they also can have that Savior? So I think yeah, that's... Yeah, everybody. That's right. you got to live for an audience of one. And uh, that's, that's for sure. So... With that, um, if there's any other questions, Don and I will stay a few extra minutes. Um, but I'm going to ask if Don would just close this out in sure. prayer. Let's pray. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word. We're grateful for the uh, the word that you did give us. I, we're not satisfied with the details that you gave us, Lord. We want to know more. We want to understand more. But we understand that you, in your perfect wisdom, gave us just what we needed for our life right now today, Lord. Um, I know that at some point these, these passages that are still unclear to us will be more clear to the people who are living during this time, Lord. And they'll have greater insight, like the book of Daniel suggests, into what, they, what these things mean. But for us, it's clear that you're coming back at some point, and before that time you're going to um, extend grace to people to come to the saving knowledge of you, Lord. And as your church, we know it's our responsibility to be that light and salt that Matt was talking about, Lord. We pray we you will find us worthy, that you will find us a light and salt as you come back for us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. All right, Babylon next week. Revelation 17 and 18.